This is the Rokinon 135 millimeter F2 lens. So it's a prime telephoto lens, that mid range at 135 millimeters. And this lens has quite the reputation in the astrophotography world. There's a lot of people using this lens specifically for astrophotography, thanks to that uh, impressive F ratio of F2, that's in a lot of light, and that real great focal length of 135 millimeters. I kind of pulled the group of my Facebook followers on the Astro Backyard Facebook page to see which lens I should buy next for astrophotography. And uh, based on the great experience I had with my previous Rokinon lens, the 14 millimeter F 2.8, which is like my Milky Way lens, I decided to jump on this 135. It's very affordable and the optics are really impressive. If you look around online, you'll find lots of example images taken with this 135. A few things to note, first of all, it's a fully manual lens, so no autofocus. And even for the aperture, you need to control the f-stop using this ring. And it's really cool because you can see the aperture blades actually clicking in. There's nine of them to, uh, to change the iris to get from f2 to f22. So most people will be shooting between f2 and f4 when it comes to astrophotography because, of course, those low light situations at night, uh, you really want to maximize the aperture of your lens in those situations. So speaking of that, I've talked to a few guys that own this lens and uh, they recommend stopping it down to f2.8 or even f4 to really sharpen up the stars with this lens. When you shoot at f2, as great as it is, uh, you can let in so much light, you can use a less aggressive ISO setting, a shorter exposure, but the stars really are hard to focus and you might start to get some vignetting and glare off those bright stars. So I've done a few test images using this already from the backyard. Uh, using my Canon 60 DA, which is a crop sensor DSLR. And uh, I was shooting those images at f2.8 and I was really happy with how the stars turned out. So it's a full frame lens. So if you have a full frame camera, it has full coverage there. The diameter is 77 millimeters. Uh, as you can see, it's got this removable lens hood. And what I really like about this is that it's flat on the top. It's not that pedal shape like on the, uh, the 14 millimeter f2.8. So it makes shooting flat frames a lot easier because you can put either a white card or stretch a white t-shirt over here to shoot flat frames which is uh, really important when you're trying to correct uh, gradients and vignetting in your astrophotography images so i love that so it's a very travel portable friendly lens that way so you might have heard me talk about before when you travel to a dark sky site you want to focus on wide field imaging uh, as opposed to the deep sky astrophotography through a telescope. That's my opinion anyway. You want to travel light, you don't want to have too much with you. Maybe you're traveling on a plane somewhere, so a lens is great for that. And this 135 millimeter focal length is, is what makes this lens uh, really special in my eyes because I shoot wide at 14, 17 millimeters. That's, you know, getting a, a landscape image, a Milky Way, or I usually go deeper than that, 250 with the red cap, 300 with that telephoto lens, 400, and then after that, you're into the telescope range of the 500 and beyond. But at 135, it's all about the framing. So it opens up new projects for astrophotography. You can get multiple DSOs in a single shot. So some stuff that's not possible without creating a massive mosaic. Rokinon is the name, but it also goes under the name Samyang. So on the box for this, it actually said optics by Samyang optics. So I don't know the difference between Rokinon and Samyang, and I believe that the lenses under both names are identical. So this one's the Rokinon 135 ED UMC. So the ED means extra low dispersion glass. So there's, I believe there's 11 elements. All those glass elements are there to produce contrast and color correction. So focusing all the light into the same point. And that's really demanding. When you're doing astrophotography and you're capturing these bright stars uh, in low light conditions, that really puts optics to the test. So if this lens can handle these long exposure deep sky images, uh, it should be really good for daytime photography as well. Uh, speaking of that, I have tested it doing some video footage with it. Uh, I'm actually gonna show, share some of the footage I took with uh, this lens for video, uh, which I was really impressed with. The, the bokeh is beautiful at f2, the depth of field is just incredible. So I'll get more use out of this lens than, than just astrophotography, but that is mainly why I got it. One of the, my favorite things about the lens is the, uh, 
the really stiff yet smooth kind of contradict each other. The, there's just a nice tension to the focus ring. So in astrophotography, you don't want something that's really loose and slippery. Uh, it holds its focus really tightly. If you want to go a step further than that, you can even tape it down, which is exactly what I did when I found focus. And then there's indicators here to show you the exact uh, marker where your focus is. And you know, as you know, for astrophotography, focus is, is everything. If you're shooting from the city like me, you might want to put a uh, light pollution filter inside the body of the camera. So uh, lenses like this are great because you can put in um, a light pollution filter. As you can see, I've got the Clip-In L-Pro filter there, which did a great job on uh, the images from the backyard. Full frame is best, so I've got the crop factor when using it with this Canon uh, APS-C camera of 1.6. So I'm in a little deeper than that, which uh, isn't a bad thing. It's still plenty wide for deep sky targets. So where this lens falls short in terms of focal length is at 135, it's nothing like a telescope. So, you know, the smaller deep sky objects, yeah, almost all of the galaxies are gonna be way too small for 135. For this lens, it's all about framing up those wide areas of sky with a lot going on. So as for isolated small deep sky objects, this, is, this lens is, is not for that. Um, you can almost capture in some of the smaller constellations all in a single frame. That's how wide it is. Okay, so let's look at the data captured using the Rokinon 135 with my Canon 60DA camera. First of all, this is pretty interesting. This is, uh, you're looking at Adobe Bridge right now. And uh, if you've heard me talk about it before, how low some of these objects are in my night sky, have a look at the Lagoon Nebula. It couldn't get any closer to skimming my, uh, my neighbors, the roof of their garage. Look at that. So I'm not kidding when I say these objects are really low. But let's have a look at um, the framing you can expect with this camera. So this is in Stellarium, which is a free planetarium software. And what you can do in this, it's, what is it called? It's called the image sensor frame. So you can actually set up the size of your image sensor, sensor in your camera and your telescope or your lens, and it will give you the predicted field of view. So it's great for planning projects to see, you know, what the, the image scale should be. So I've got it set to my 60 DA right now. And then the Rokinon 135 that I've entered in. Let's see the difference here. So the Esprit 100, you know that telescope that I used, there's the framing for the Lagoon Nebula, which is funny because I just shot it through the Esprit and it's that, it's that exact size. Uh, so it holds true. Uh, let's go, there's my 102. So let's go back to the 135. So as you can see, the image frame, the size of that image sensor plus this lens, the framing is pretty well exactly the, uh, the preview image you saw in Bridge there. So you can use this to, to plan your projects. Well, let's say we're out in Cygnus. So look at in Cygnus here, you can get the, the Veil Nebula, the, uh, the Cygnus Loop, the whole complex, Pickering's Triangle, all of, the, all of the Veil Nebula region and more. So that's massive. Normally, if you're in with a telescope, let's see. So with my 294 and my 102, <laughs> there you go. You get the, uh, the Eastern Veil only. Uh, if we go back to the Rokinon, I've got my 14 millimeter in there too. And so the T3i is also another crop sensor. So back to this. And then if you go to um, Insignus here, this is another region I shot. So the nebulosity surrounding the star Seder, Insignus and the Crescent Nebula. And here's the framing you can expect there. And as you're about to see, uh, that's that held true in, in my experiences in the backyard. Let's go into Photoshop here. So here's just a quick process of the Lagoon and Triffid Nebula. So it was difficult. I didn't get enough exposure time because the garage kind of got in the way there, the roof. So I think the stack was, do I still have Deep Sky Stacker open? There you go. So uh, one, just over one hour in total, 42 frames at ISO 400, two minutes each. And you can't see anything here in Deep Sky Stacker, but the, I did a quick process in Photoshop so that's what it looks like, and I don't know about you, but that gets me really excited to shoot deep sky objects at this focal length, 135. I'm absolutely thrilled with the way this turned out. Um, you know, these all of these massive, huge telescopes that require these robust mounts, and you can capture images like this 
which are so, so fantastic using this affordable 135 millimeter camera lens. Now this one I shot, I stopped the lens all the way down to f4. So, you know, maybe you, you're, you want to shoot at f2 to get that light gathering power, but you're going to get better stars at f2.8 or even f4 like I've shot here. So there was a bit of star trailing. There was no dithering, no auto guiding on this or anything. This is just on that Fornax mount, which is a great little mount camera tracker um, with limited data. So, you know, this is far from a, an APOD image, but really cool to see the, the field of view. Uh, this one is the Seda region. I believe there, there was even less integrated time here. Again, two minute shots. And I, I was shooting at two, f2.8 for these ones. So the stars don't look as good, but still relatively very decent and acceptable. Uh, there's the little baby crescent nebula in there, and then the butterfly nebula here, and all this awesome nebulosity in uh, the Cygnus region. And uh, it's really cool to uh, not only just to see these deep sky objects at this field of view, but also to, to find new objects in here, like these regions over here to the, to the left of the butterfly, I might want to get the telescope out and shoot those at a higher magnification. Really cool. So to show you examples of some more complete images, my friend Eric, who uh, he's been a long time follower of Astro Backyard, such a nice guy, he's constantly shooting. He might be the only guy that's out shooting more than I am. He shot the Ro Ophi Ophiuki Cloud Complex. I'll, I'll learn how to say that one day. And this is like the perfect example of the type of target you could shoot at 135. He did this from a dark sky site and it was like a bucket list target for Eric and it turned out just great. I love this. So this is his image on Astrobin. So Eric Cobble, you should, you should definitely check him out on Astrobin, Twitter. He's everywhere. And then to show an example of uh, some winter targets, here's Orion and it's basically Orion's belt, the Horsehead Nebula, the flame. And uh, I believe this is a crop because I think you could even include M78 at this focal length. I know he's, he's using a dedicated astronomy camera with this 135. It's the uh, 168C, so uh, same sensor size as, as a DSLR, but uh, those cooled capabilities. So really cool uh, data that's captured through the 135. I mean, I'm, I'm impressed. Sometimes it's the best judge of equipment is just to see the results. I, I definitely believe that. So I hope this gives you a better idea of the kind of projects you could shoot with the 135. And uh, yeah, 